Where do I have the clicker? This, am I on? Yes. Perfect. I mean, I'm not a robot. I'm representing AI, but uh, I have this little box there, so I feel a bit like a cyborg. And also, uh, as was said, I'm a, I'm a tech expert, so I'm pretty nervous, and the room is like full of actors. <laughs> but I also know... Uh, mm, you guys, like, uh, as Luca said, I've been through uh, the School of Improvisation, so I know that like, this is the best crowd, and every mistake is welcome. I'm going to make a lot of them, <laughs> I can promise, because I'm just a human. But today, I'm going to speak about, yeah, the artificial intelligence, or actually, I, and <laughs> AI, and AI. <laughs> uh, and I I guess I got qualified for this event because I've always been, or my whole life has been a constant fight in between uh, the natural sciences or technology and um, more like the humanities. I mean, in between the brains and the hearts. And I really believe that applied improvisation is actually connecting both of it, or that's what I've always used within the School of Improvisation. And also, I did my PhD at the School of Computer Science, but uh, in my PhD thesis, I actually tried to teach the machines how to read human emotions. And I believe this is like um, the greatest capability of you guys, or that's what we learn within uh, applied improvisation. So. That's why I'm here, and I'd like to explain the basic principles of AI and explain to you what is AI anyways. The thing is, I tried to squeeze the two semesters of this seminar at the School of Computer Science, so it may get a bit techy at some places, but I also tried to use lots of theater metaphors. But Maybe before we get into artificial intelligence, I'd be wondering what do you think intelligence is and whether it has to do maybe with emotions or even improvising. Any ideas? Definitions? Anybody consider him or herself intelligent? What does it mean? <laughs> okay, then what it is then? Very well, very well. Because like, there are many, many definitions. But I like this one, that it's the ability to achieve goals somehow. Within AI, we say or, um, that the general intelligence is then the ability to achieve any goal. And then we have this general artificial intelligence which is considered a non-biological system that is capable of achieving any goal. So, some automated agent, we say. And the time span in between the predictions of when we, as a humankind, are going to achieve this, is actually getting shorter and shorter. And the last predictions, uh, this is like kind of a... Uh, public uh, forecasting platform that is called Metaculus, and it's really famous for being super precise. Uh, so it says that as a result of a combination of the foundation models, I'm not going to explain the notion of the foundation models, but it's something really, really advanced in technology, and the type of a machine learning that is called reinforcement learning, we are going to be there by 2030. That's actually pretty close, ain't it? But of course, there were some, there was quite some journey, and it took us quite some time to get there, right? So, uh, artificial intelligence as such, or the term, was first used in the 50s, but already in the 40s, and everything, by the way, connected to uh, AI is either connected to a war or a porn. So, <laughs> but this was the war, this was not the porn yet, although we are getting there. I'm afraid, I hope you don't know, <laughs> but if you do the research, there is lots of AI, whatever. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
for 1940s, there was Alan Turing and the Turing test and the, the Enigma and uh, basically uh, more AI as uh, in the space of kind of cybersecurity. And then the most formative years within AI were the, the, from 50s to 80s, where systems like Eliza, this funny little Rogerian therapist, were put into being by, by Joseph Wiesenbaum. And then due to the lack of the computational power, there was um, the season of what we called the first AI winter. But after that, in 1980s, there was a huge revival and there were expert systems coming into being. These were the rule-based systems, still defined by the experts, but it was already um, getting better and better, all leading up to the modern AI as we sort of know it today, uh, the development or the rise of machine learning and uh, you've probably heard about the IBM Deep Blue. That was the chess player, the system that actually bet uh, Kasparov. And yeah, it's a pretty slippery slope, <laughs> in, at least in some fields, uh, since then. Then from 2010 till now, uh, we've been using the algorithms of the so-called deep learning, which is uh, a set of algorithms that is now simulating or mimicking the neural networks, exactly the same thing we have in our brains. And uh, it all led to the recent developments, which is generative pre-trained transformers. The most no GPT, chat GPT being parts of it. But before there was GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, it has a much shorter memory, but it was actually the first system I personally used to generate a theater play. And that theater play was actually put on stage here in the Czech Republic. It was horrible. <laughs> like, any improvisation is much better than the piece we put together. Actually, these were a couple of smaller pieces because the memory was not good enough to keep the whole play as one piece to be really um, comprehensible um, and cohesive. But it already happened, and it was kind of reasonable. Now, what a transformer is, it's this type of deep learning model that is used for the natural language processing tasks, the one you probably, knew, you probably know from the GPT. And this is how it works, in, explained in a nerdy way, I would say. So you can forget about this one. It's just for the sake of complexity and for you to see what's actually in there, but you need to prepare the input, meaning put the words uh, or put the text into tokens, meaning particular words. You have to do some positional coding, embedding. Then you have to encode your data with a multi-layer encoder. You have to decode it, and then there is this output that is generating the tokens. In the world of theater, <laughs> you could probably uh, imagine this as uh, this input preparation as casting or script preparation, the encoding as the director's rehearsal, the decoding as the drift rehearsals, and the output is probably as the opening night. Now, what are the basic AI principles? This is the computer science stuff, but I'll try to be quick. But one of these main principles is actually the AI learns from the data. That's actually... Um, a no-brainer, but still you've got different types of machine learning. Uh, one of them being supervised, that's what we do within improvising. It's uh, learning with a teacher. Then the systems can learn in the unsupervised way, meaning learning directly from the data without a teacher. And the reinforcement learning is learning from the previous rounds of um, data analysis by the system. Then you get to represent the data within typically some knowledge base, Wikipedia-like, you can imagine. Or you got to use the reasoning and inference. You can search through the data and optimize it using different sorts of search, like heuristic search or optimization techniques. And then uh, this natural language processing or natural language generation, these are just two other principles of AI. Then you have the whole family of AI uh, system that actually include computer vision and speech and audio detection. Uh, and uh, 
the interaction and robotics, like human AI interaction or these intelligent robotic agents. Not only speaking about chatbots, but we're going to get there because this is where uh, we have a lot in common, I believe. It's super adaptable because it's actually able to improvise. Uh, it's very flexible. You can use the generalization, but also transfer learning, meaning that you train the system on one set of the data, and then you use the pre-trained system on different sorts of data, and it still works. It could work even better. You have to fine-tune a little bit, but it kind of really works. And uh, part of the principles is also evaluation, of course. Whatever you do, you have to measure the performance. You got to do the benchmarking. And last but not least, uh, the important part of it is cognitive computing and the mention artificial general intelligence. So that's for the technicalities. But the question is why you need it, right? And I really believe that who, that's the Czech saying, but there is no uh, English uh, translation, like not the proper one. But who stands a while, uh, who stands for a while, stands aside in a while, we say. And that basically means that there are lots of tasks you still get to do manually, right? And I really like this quotation by Joanna Maciejska, who said that she wants AI to do her laundry and dishes so that she could do art and writing. Right. That's a good one. That's a good one. Although I use AI a lot for cooking. I've got three little children, so it really saves my time when I have leftovers. And they also ask the why questions all the time. So why is banana curve is my favorite. <laughs> Do you know why banana is curved, by the way? Oh, it, it actually, at first um, there is a blossom, but then it goes uh, towards the sun, like a sunflower. So they grow this way. It's not like this way, but this direction. That's what I know, thanks to AI. <laughs> uh, and why the sky is blue, why the grass is green, and all that. By the way, <laughs> my daughter asked me why we can't uh, walk around naked when there's such a hot weather. And I was like, I tried to explain the social, cultural concepts and how it's inappropriate. And then I asked ChatGPT, and uh, it told me because we, got sun we would get sunburned. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe us humans are not always the most intelligent, right? But imagine, just to organize this event, the whole administrative load of the email management, uh, booking the plane tickets, booking the hotels, the document management, expense management, just the budgeting for this whole thing, and the invoice processing is probably still yet to come, right? It's actually lots of work, and you can very easily use uh, AI for it. So I would be wondering, what is it that prevents you if you still don't use ChatGPT? Do you actually? Do you work with uh, AI on a daily basis? Who does? Ah, uh, still some people are shy, but fear not. It's really, really easy. By the way, this is how uh, my presentation template came, came into life. I wanted something that would match with my dress. You know? <laughs> no, that's not true. I first made the presentation, and then I had to buy a dress, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, you've got these programs, like this is Slides Go. And you can prompt it the way, like, I want to have something funny, cheerful, colorful, connected to a theater theme, but also technological. And uh, the system came up with these funny little slides nobody else has. <laughs> so, uh, and it all took me a couple of minutes. Uh, so, don't hesitate to use it in your daily life, but also, I believe uh, we can let the machines work for improvising theater and applied improvisation, because I'd be wondering how long does it take you to come up with 20 impro scenarios. And especially if it's a given domain, it could really take time, right? To make it thoughtful, creative, interesting. With a very, very simple prompting, it took the machine 30 seconds and some of them are kind of boring, basic, but some of them are really funny, like um, I like number eight, the medieval office, where you uh, have the office environment set in the med medieval times, but the knights, wizards, and scribe work together 
in a corporate setting, or, and you can, of course, adjust it. Like, you can say, you want to do this for uh, the business training, you want to do this for, I don't know, all sorts of domains. And as I said, it took me 30 seconds to come up with it. Uh, and there are many, many fields within AI. You can actually use it. You can use it within training and simulation to actually create environments and characters for yourself that can actually interact with the human improvisers and uh, provide yourself with realistic scenarios. Some of them you can also, like I tried mostly with unrealistic, and we can then discuss what creativity is in this case. But uh, um, the good thing is you can come up with these scenarios across various domains, even the domains you are not necessarily familiar with. So if you guys go to a corporate company, want to give them a training in improvising, you can just ask ChatGPT, like this is the, I don't know, uh, some e-commerce company that are within, I don't know, customer finance, what are the most typical situations and how to leverage that. Uh, on the other hand, you can actually uh, get the real-time feedback and coaching uh, within, like, as you communicate with the system. And you can also then, I'll get to it, but you can also get the feedback on the videos. Like, I cannot wait to get the video of my talk back and let the AI analyze it and see where I <laughs> did not do that well. But uh, it's, it's, um, it, it's already available. Um, you can generate prompts and scenarios uh, for different, uh, like with a set of different constraints for these improvisation exercises. Uh, and again, it's not just the environment, just the domain, but it can be different genres, settings, very specific challenges. If it would be, I don't know, handicapped sportsmen, whatever, uh, you can uh, come up with very viable scenarios. Actually, I also use it to generate some scenarios, well, for my kids, but also for their bedtime stories. And it could be a great fun. Like, my kids always come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. So these bedtime stories about a uh, unicorn riding a cucumber, whatever magic stuff, it's really, it really works for that. Uh, you can uh, enhance the creative collaboration. I mean, uh, AI as such is not, or is creative in the same way as we humans are. It just has uh, better training data, I would say, because we only can work with um, our own our own personal history and our own memories and capacities. But uh, this could be leveraged to actually come up with uh, uh, ideas for the creative collaboration. And uh, we all have different um, weaknesses. We are all very individual. So it's very good for personalized learning because it can really adapt the training programs to the individual needs and um, skills level of improvisers, and it can offer personalized exercise, because in some areas you're doing very well, but at some it's not maybe that good, and you get some challenges, and uh, it can even help you to target these specific areas for improvement. The data-driven insights is exactly that you can analyze large data sets of improvisation performances and see uh, where we also not going that great as a group. And um, then uh, especially uh, I've seen this uh, in the videos or the group of corporate people trying to you know, improvise, being shy, some standing in the corner. And uh, it was suggesting like some teaching methodologies and uh, helping beginner, beginners learn from the best practices. And, uh, and this one is also, by the way, used a lot in the computer games. Uh, it can incorporate, incorporate and come up with different AI characters. So um, it can be used as a virtual improvisation partner or character within these, uh, within these generated scenarios. And last but not least, but again, um, this is coming from the game industry because it's not just war and porn, but it's also a gaming industry. And it's improvisation in VR where you have this 
uh, uh, these glasses and uh, it can provide you like very realistic settings for improvisation and you can interact with these virtual characters. I mean, I still see the benefit of you guys being here together physically, but not everybody. <laughs> so far, so far. <laughs> but uh, the question is what's next, right? And uh, what's the yes and principle? What are we going to do with it? Because we probably still want to meet physically. And that actually brings me to the topic of the AI for humans. And I mean both applied improvisation and artificial intelligence. Because I'd be wondering, what is your mission? Like, what's the mission of AI in your sense? What is it? I hope you have one. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What is to achieve? Because for me, but I'm, uh, I was just a pupil at the School of Improvisation, but it was to some extent to cheer people up, let be present, let them forget about the world. And I believe AI and AI can have the same mission in this respect, because uh, I've been playing around a lot with AI and ChatGPT. And um, the other day, I was just ra quite randomly asking uh, ChatGPT about the random acts of kindness. And as you go through them, you can see these are all improvising topics, right? All this can get you out of your comfort zone. And of course, it's taming the shrew. Uh, the AI can be used both for good and for evil. But uh, if you ask for these nice things, it seems to be actually pretty good, and it also seems to have a lot in common, not only with humans as such, but also with improvisers. Because compliment strangers, that was the first thing you guys did this morning. And it's improvisation. Or baking for, for neighbors and go out there, knock the door, Come on, for many people, it's really getting out of their comfort zone and it can get really, really scary. But uh, I didn't prompt the system the way it would come up with something this actionable, and it's still dead. So uh, my question is also how many lonely people are there? Because what I've seen a lot with an applied improvisation was helping out people, yeah, cheering them up, as well, but in my group, there were, I wouldn't say loners, but definitely people that had been alone for a while, and especially after COVID, when we are all kind of getting back together, we really were craving to meet others and interact with them physically. But then, of course, you've got people in the retired people's homes, and these are some of them, my, my grandmother is actually in, in one of them, and she's lucky enough to have us to go visit, but uh, there are many lonely people and uh, the nurses, they don't have enough time to interact with everybody. I mean, they can change your diapers, they will bring your, you food, but uh, the biggest problem is actually the social in isolation mentioned here. AI in senior care is a big topic. You've got all these wearables and remote monitoring technologies that are connected to smart homes, so you can get a call when, you're, when the senior is alone at home and he or she falls, for instance. There are many gadgets for the mental well-being that starts playing personalized music to ease anxiety and agitation uh, and agitate the symptoms if the person feels lonely, but the important thing is really that they miss the companionship and conversations, engaging conversations, games, playing games, getting information. And ChatGPT, as well as applied improvisation, can actually help out with it. Uh, you can train it even with a personalized voice, the voice of 
your children, the voice of your best friend from your childhood. And uh, the same way I generated the scenarios for improvising theater, you can generate the topics for engaging, in, in for, for engaging uh, conversations in the retired people's homes. So I said the uh, general artificial intelligence is approaching, and with that, or it, these thoughts actually brought me back to my favorite episode of the Black Mirror that is called Be Right Back. And it's about the girl whose husband passed away within a car accident and uh, then she, she trains a chatbot based on their conversations and she keeps communicating with him. First, he's missing the, the physical body. But the thing is, then these retired people can even have a conversation with their loved ones that are not around anymore because our generations, we are already putting together enough training data. I mean, how many messages you generate every day, how many WhatsApp messages, this can all be used as a training data to discuss with people that are not around anymore. I mean, it's sad and encouraging at the same time. But especially for the people who really are alone and have no capacities, it could be some kind of, you know, compromise. But uh, I would really like to end up my talk with uh, the fact that, yes, ChatGPT and AI can be the best yes and sayer, and you can have a lot of engaging conversations and you can simulate the voice of your family, but I would still hope we as humans are going to rely on our physical bodies because if there is a benefit of AI in your sense it's this. Look at yourself, you're physically here, you can hug each other and no machine is going to give you this oxytocin shot. So with that I want to thank you and hug you all. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, to the Q&As, uh, there will be somebody passing on the mic to you. Before that happens, I'll have a first question, um, which is like a win-win, because if it's good, it sparks the conversation, and if it's bad, I lowered the bar. You touched upon the, the topic of creativity. So I'll allow you more to, to discuss what is the difference between how the AI is creative or creative and how humans are creative. Yeah, in this respect, AI is actually maybe too perfect to my taste. Like if you ask for a picture of a biking panda, it's going to give you a perfect realistic picture of biking panda bear. But if my four years old girl is going to draw a cute little panda on the bike, it's not going to be perfect, but I would still consider it to be more creative. Mm -hmm. So having a data set, lar the training data set large enough doesn't necessarily mean that the output is always the most creative, right? The question is what creativity is, but I believe there is more to that than just seeing enough data and being able to put it out there somehow, right? Thank you so much. So, the way it works is so you raise your hand, you get a mic. Uh, if you don't get a mic, then you know you have to wait. I know it's obvious, yeah. Thank you. So my question would be like there are these language models, and when you said 2030 is when you expect general AI. So what do you can you say a little bit more what general AI would be? Yeah, it's the system that is actually able to perform any task, meaning uh, it's able to infer like we humans do. So if you tell it, if you, I don't know, um, ask it to solve a problem, it would somehow and probably the way us humans are not able to solve the task. And not just a riddle, but also tasks that are out there. The thing is, many people say that AI uh, will help us keep these uh, or, uh, professions that are still like handcrafting and, and stuff like that. But I can also imagine that one day there will be this smart dog that will work as a plumber. 
It would probably come to your kitchen, look around, see the, where the problem is, connect to the internet, and fix the pipes for you. <laughs> well, the only thing that's not happening yet is because it's costly, but it's possible. Like everybody says that we will still need the builders and plumbers and all these professions, but the robots can do well even better when it comes to climbing, by the way. So I've seen the DARPA challenge, I've been following it, that's the robots challenge. And 10 years ago, it was not able uh, to climb up the stairs. Now it's doing the any sorts of gymnastics you can think of. I can't do that. Yeah. Hi, Katka. Can I, can I ask the next question? Thank you for your presentation. So you mentioned that you use ChatGPT for uh, answering question of your kids. I don't know what age they are, but uh, would you say that, uh, you know, going further, like when they are teenagers, would ChatGPT be something, you know, they can freely go ask a question and get a correct answer? Would you be like willing to do that? Or would you want to act as a sensor you know, like in terms of like filtering what they can access or not. Thanks. Yeah, I would definitely, but my kids are two, three, and four. I'm very good in scaling. <laughs> I've always worked with the big data. <laughs> so they're 15 months apart, but they uh, ask these actually rather complex questions. Uh, my daughter asked me, why is it called up there in the mountains? And then because, uh, she was wondering because it's closer to the sun, right? Makes sense. And I was like, whew, okay, there is some non um, intuitive physics behind. The same with why the sky is, well, why the sky is blue, I can do for a three year old, but why the sky is black in the night is actually a rather complex explanation. So, um, and you can prompt it the way, please explain to the three year old why the sky is black in the night. And you get actually very comprehensible answer though you have to believe the machine that it's true. There are some ways how to actually do the fact checking. But uh, I also teach at the university and my students experiment with this a lot and they tend to follow no matter what and there I would really be cautious. The thing is people are still too naive and even like, my students are pretty smart, they're all computer science students, but they would still generate the, their thesis uh, together with the references. And that's my way when I'm like, hey, who's this author from Singapore I've never heard about? Could you explain to me how did she get that reference and what is this article about? And that's where we get into the discussions about plagiarism. So I don't think it's uh, possible to um, put a ban on it. The gin is out there of the bottle and you can put it back. But uh, I would definitely, I will never give up, give up on pushing people and my students to the critical thinking. Also because it's getting more and more uh, difficult to, uh, to realize that the text data had been gen uh, generated. I, by the way, in my professional life I work with forensics and my job is to actually being able to uh, spot the generated data, and it's really getting more and more difficult. Well, we so, by the way, my, my only, if, I, if, you, if there is one take home message, just have a safe word with your family. Whomever is calling you, asking for money, ask the name of your pet or whatever. <laughs> yeah, cool. sorry for that. Next question. Okay, I have a question. If it's, uh, I saw your thesis was about emotions, which really caught me, and I'm thinking, uh, fear, uh, because there's a lot of pushback on rules. What are we going to do? How can we control the development? So my question to you would be, what do you fear about where we're going with AI? Um, I fear we're going to get used to it, because I always was thinking about AI as a good servant. But lately, it seems to me that us as humans, we are adjusting to the AI whereas I was always hoping the AI would adjust to us. That's my fear. May I ask? I love the caricature, and I only know AI as words and text. Sorry. Um, is AI able to illustrate and make fun illustrations? 
What? What are... Is AI able to make illustrations like your caricature there? Yeah. They, sure. It is. Okay. I always uh, think of it as words and text. It only. creates also sort of like the last resort was videos, but now even the fake videos are really, really good. My question is, by the way, whether deep fakes, on the other hand, whether before AI you were able to recognize that this picture was really taken this place and this war and not the other war five years ago. So it's really difficult to tell the truth anyways. I, yeah. I have a question on uh, teaming with AI. So I'm here on the side. Um, so how do you expect collaboration to change as soon as AI enters a team in a mixed environment of people and AI? How to team up would be... How does it change our collaboration and our collaboration patterns? Within applied improvisation or in general? In general. In, in general, general yeah. we are communicating less and less. I've seen it already in my generation. I, I've, especially during the COVID times, it was after a very long time when I was uh, when I started calling my friends again, because with all the messengers and WhatsApps, like we don't do it anymore. And what scares me as well is also, like I often get this question whether it's gonna kill us as a humankind, but I'm sometimes concerned that we gonna die out because we are gonna stop having sex. Because it's available and it's so easy for the shy people out there. There are studies from Japan where people actually stop going on dates because the systems are so good and you can tell it all sorts of things you probably wouldn't share with a human being, at least not on the first date, I hope, that people really stop communicating in the erotic way. So that would also be that's, that's the way how it's probably uh, gonna yeah, somehow change the communication. Uh, you mentioned uh, using AI to give notes to improvisers. Mm -hmm. So watching a performance and, and giving feedback and making the performance better. Could you give an example or explain just a little, tell me a little more about that? Mm -hmm. It's a system, they're already out there, that is basically like watching the videos, analyzing the data points, and is able to, for instance, detect that something has changed, like there is a change of the atmosphere or change of behavior of the people, and then it can um, um, track the reactions, whether the audience was laughing, so it was probably a good thing. And also it can, like during the improvisation or generally in theater, can uh, come up with these topics to change the scene. You know, what we do with an improvisation when you ask the audience, so what would be the next environment? The question is whether we actually need it because it's fun to have a real humans, but for training, why not? Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm a big fan of AI, and I use it in my uh, applied improvisation uh, company almost every day. Fantastic. Uh, please tell me that you and your colleagues are having conversations about privacy issues and about the cost, the energy cost of AI. We, we watched uh, OpenAI go from a nonprofit company to a huge for-profit company. Uh, as, the same way we watched Google go from do no evil to uh, li leave us alone. <clears throat> so please, please reassure us that, that you and your colleagues are having those conversations. Yes. Actually, uh, in my work, I'm a head of uh, data science and risk division of a technological company. So the first thing I did when I joined the company, uh, we put together the AI principles, like the guidelines, who's responsible for the data, where it sits, where it belongs. I had to educate them on, you cannot send any data out there. We built a private cloud, we put everything in there, and still, yeah, you gotta be responsible. I believe this should be part of um, education already, the basic schools. We're just afraid, I'm just afraid the corporations are going to see all of this information and just, it's just, they'll salivate at getting that information about us. Well, <laughs> oftentimes you agree with it without even knowing it. Only two days ago, I was uh, in talks with a company that are trying to improve some marketing research, and they have this little app that you push the button on your phone and it starts uh, recording everything you do out there and they want to adjust the marketing campaigns based on it. 
and they people some money to do it for them to collect the data and people are happy sharing for 50 bucks so it's on us each individual how much we value our private data but there are some guidelines out there definitely at least here in Europe we are working on it there's the AI act it's not you can't just let go you cannot um, I have a question about uh, the relationship between AI and humans. Um, the, the examples I've heard is that the best chess players now are, are a fusion of AI and human, and that that's the best chess player in the world. So can you provide other real-world examples of how a human plus these systems is reaching elevated knowledge, because uh, so I think that is a positive relationship. And then maybe a quick follow-up, how can humans prepare themselves to be in relationship with these systems and not get swallowed the way we were by social media? Hmm. I've seen this a lot, actually. One example from our own company would be the HR. Like we've got piles of CVs, like incoming CVs, that the individual recruiters would have to go through, and they would throw away half of them just because they're missing skills. And the AI can go through the documents and only pick the relevant CVs, and then the human recruiter can go through it, for instance. Yeah, there are many, especially the document processing. It always depends on where you put your, we call it a threshold, where the humans take over, but there are many, many routine tasks, like every support center, there are ladies sitting there reading through emails and then sending them to the right addresses. You can have AI doing this for you easily. There is, I've been doing a lot of AI transformation, but the biggest obstacle is actually human ego, because you are taking away the expertise from people. And my question would be, because my argument or our argument always is, yeah, but let them do something more exciting, something more important. But some people just don't have capacities to do something more exciting. They don't want to do something more uh, exciting. They want to be sitting in front of their boring Excel tables and be perfectly happy about it because they are not able to do anything else. And that would be actually a question about uh, the, the lowest guaranteed income. I mean, I'm not a communist or anything, but on the other hand, there are people out there that are only able to put together the envelopes, licking it. So what are you going to do with them? They can always cut the grass, but come on, there are robots cutting grass, right? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I, I really like your very simple definition of intelligence, so thank you for that. And having said that, would you think that I mean, if you ask nine other, uh, 10 people what is intelligence, they would immediately go to the cognitive, let's say, left hemisphere side of your brain. Would you say that uh, in the coming years that will be less and less important and your other aspects of intelligence will become more important and that it has a lot of complications for us as applied, improvisation, um, applied improvisers who work more, I would say, on the other parts of the intelligence Spectre. So well, I believe emotions, kindness, and care are really important aspect of maybe not being intelligent. There are many intelligent assholes out there, but it's definitely what makes us humans. And that's, these are cognitive abilities that I see actually on the rise. Because as long as this black box neural network stuff doesn't have a physical body, we're going to win. Last question. I'm so sorry. This yeah. is the last one. Oh, yeah. oh, I know. But meet me somewhere in the backstage okay. or wherever. Just, I'm oh, happy okay. to continue the discussion. Yeah. Hi. Um, one of the things that I find sometimes worrisome to see is when kids are glued, and also adults, to their tablets or um, phones. And when you take them away, it's like they have no imagination anymore to play games or to use imagination. And um, if us improvisers will use AI more, how would that affect the use of our imagination and our creativity that just comes from how we play? And would we 
start to suffer under the pressure of perfection because we would start AI, to use AI more and AI is creative, like, is creative perfection. It's about setting up the borders, which is definitely easier for us adult improvisers than for the kiddies. But even with the kids, as I said, I've got three small kids. They're easily addicted, but there are even already books for parenting um, or methodological books on parenting when they advise you many things, like, for instance, give them something to look forward to after, and there is a limited span and limited time for them to be watching on something, and then promise to do a real action in a real life. And uh, it's so far away from the digital world. Like my kids, by the way, at this very moment, they're sitting by the river with my grandparents, with my parents, and are enjoying the nature and are really close to the forest. And they're hungry for it, especially because they grew up in the city. But enough is enough. You're going to get bored. Like, I rely on this a lot that nobody can actually be sitting in front of their tablets for so much time. It's at some point the human part of you is, is going to take over. Maybe only because you need to go to the toilet and you're never going to get back. But they've been like people were saying this about we're going to get addicted to TV. I mean, we still survived. So, <laughs> yeah, well. Guys, Some thank you us. so much for your questions. Thank you, Katarina.